You're listening to a podcast from evidencenetwork.ca, making evidence matter in Canadian health policy. Before a medication is approved for use in Canada, it undergoes clinical trials that test how effectively the drug treats a specific health condition. In doctor speak, that's called an indication, and observes any risks or side effects associated with the drug. If the trial data seems reliable and safe enough, the drug is made available to the healthcare market, and then Canada basically stops keeping track of that drug. True, we do have an adverse drug reporting system, but it's voluntary and time-consuming. In fact, it's estimated that less than 5% of all adverse drug events are reported to Health Canada. Doctors Robin Tamblin and Jenna Wong at McGill University are taking a closer look at how medications are used once they hit the market. Here's Tamblin explaining why those initial clinical trials are not enough for securing drug safety. So the trials are never big enough to track something that's going to occur, one in 100,000, for example, or one in 1,000. Uh, it's never going to be able to detect stuff like that. And so when it's put into the population, now you're actually exposing millions and millions of people to that drug. Uh, and so you're going to pick up uh, adverse effects or safety issues that were not picked up in the trials that were part of the original submissions to the regulators. Clinical trials are not just limited in scale, but also in scope. For ethical and economic reasons, drug trials don't typically include children, pregnant women, or the elderly. They are not required to include patients diverse in gender or race or patients with multiple health conditions. Yet once a drug is approved for Canada's healthcare market, there are clinical guidelines but no restrictions on who may be prescribed the medication. This means when children or the elderly are prescribed drugs, it is often an off-label use or a use for which the medications have not actually been approved. Drugs are also routinely used off-label to treat conditions for which they were never tested in clinical trials. And as for those clinical guidelines, they often don't distinguish between approved versus off-label treatments. Wong says it's estimated that between 10 to 20 percent of all drugs are used for unapproved conditions. For antidepressants, that figure jumps to 30 percent. I think that off-label use is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that because it hasn't been well studied, um, that there are certain risks with it. What's also interesting is that when you speak to physicians, they themselves are also not aware of which indications are on-label and off-label. And so they're often very surprised to find out that, oh, like this drug isn't approved for this indication. Like I always prescribe it for this. I think it's just really interesting to, uh, to hear that from the physicians. So to me, it signals that, you know, we need to do a better job of maybe giving them tools that allow them to, um, know the evidence base behind which drugs they're prescribing for something. Every day, physicians across the country are carefully weighing the pros and cons of prescribing many medications for a large and diverse population of patients. Tamblin and Wong want us to take advantage of all these ongoing experiments in the real-world lab. Here's what they're proposing. What if, when doctors start medications, the prescription mentioned what condition it's being prescribed for? And what if, when doctors stop medications, they could easily cancel unnecessary prescriptions or refills? Tamblet explains why collecting data on these two activities could provide crucial information needed to ensure medications are safe and worth taking. When you're changing the dose of a drug or you're stopping a drug, there usually is a good reason for that. And 25% of the time, it's because there's an adverse drug event. And so you can take the opportunity of saying, well, like, let's make uh, stop orders uh, dose change orders, let's attach the reason for that dose change uh, and that stop order, and that way we can keep track of, uh, in a systematic way, uh, adverse drug events, and we can also uh, essentially provide that as part of the clinical documentation in the chart so that when that when someone else tries to start that drug again, nicely structured and documented that that drug actually uh, you've had it in the past, and it produced this kind of a problem, and therefore you shouldn't start it again. What we don't know, and what's the, the sort of mystery is, you know, when a drug is prescribed, what was it prescribed for? Uh, and unless you know that, you won't be able to track, you know, is it being used for conditions in which it was never tested? That's question number one. And if it is, is it proving to be effective? Uh, more effective than other drugs that could be used or other interventions that could be used for the same problem? Um, and is there a greater is- risk of, of adverse drug events if it's being used for conditions or in populations in which it was never tested? 
and it's information that would be easy to collect at a time when Health Canada is already rolling out a national digital prescribing system across the country. Instead of paper, clinics and pharmacies are moving toward electronic prescriptions. It's a system that could save patients a lot of confusion at the pharmacy, one that is already being tweaked to monitor prescription opiate use, so with another little tweak, a national prescribing system could also become an efficient surveillance system for all prescription drugs. In other words, a world-class electronic system for prescribing and monitoring drugs that is also user-friendly, which is important, says Wong, because it will not disrupt physicians' workflow. I think that if we were to implement a system that required you know, physicians to close their programs and open up another program and document information somewhere else, uh, it won't be successful just because it's disrupting the normal workflow of physicians and pharmacists. So I think information technology is a really powerful tool that we could use to gather the information we want because healthcare is already uh, kind of going very much in that direction of um, using electronic systems to track patient experiences. Instead of projecting from clinical trials or waiting for a researcher to do another study, Tamblin says a national drug surveillance system would track patient experiences across Canada in real time, making the whole healthcare system smarter in terms of what is prescribed and what is purchased. You know, you could actually collect information about the effectiveness of that drug, which the Ministries of Health would love because they really have a hard time making decisions about whether there's a value for money when they put it into a formulary. And here's the experience in terms of adverse effects by drug, you know, the collective experience across Canada. You could actually turn that around and make that available to physicians on, you know, real time at the time they're prescribing. And you could even, and I would advocate making it available to patients themselves with the experience with this drug. It could be so easy to do this. For Evidence Network, I'm Nita Das McMurtry. You've been listening to a podcast from evidencenetwork.ca, making evidence matter in Canadian health policy. Connect with the latest nonpartisan health research from experts across Canada and around the world, or sign up to receive our free monthly e-newsletter at www.evidencenetwork.ca. You can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Evidencenetwork.ca is funded by the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Research Manitoba, and the University of Winnipeg.